man's oldest form of transport. Ships make all men neighbors. The rusting tramps and splendid liars that bear the products of the world's millions of laboring people. Australia is largely dependent on the export of her fine wool, and the ships which bear it, the men who sail them and load them, forge a link in a vital chain. From the labors of the men who till the soil springs the plentiful grain, grain sorely needed in Europe and Asia. of the inland to the seaboard granaries, then down to the waiting ships, where the watersiders work to turn the ships around. Sweating below decks, handling the cargoes that meet the thousand and one needs of the community. Dusty cargoes, damaging to the lungs. from the Americas for the manufacture of chemicals, the treatment of steel, for superphosphates to make soil fertile, indispensable to industry. sulfur that burns the eyes.
timber and paper from the Canadian forests, fuel and machinery, food and textiles, 38 million tonnes in one year, stowed and slung by Australia's 24,000 waterside workers. This huge volume of cargo, an increase of 10 million tonnes in five years, handled at a rate that compares favourably with any other country. Industrial storm clouds hover on the waterfront. The industry, with its reputation of turbulence, seems beset by conflict and misunderstanding. Harsh and unfounded accusations from the daily newspapers and from the government are common. Shipping interests, always well represented in Parliament, have influenced governments to pass legislation regarded by watersiders as repressive. Legislation which threatens to deprive them of hard-won conditions. is spontaneous, and the form of their resistance the traditional one, a tradition born from struggles of the past. Rank and file discussion rank and file decision. Why do these men take such action? Action that leaves their pay envelopes lighter and their table shorter food. To understand why, it is essential to understand the background of the industry. It is essential to know something of the bitter memories of the men who worked the waterfront's hungry miles. Memories of hardship and privation. Harsh memories of the 30s. In those days of wide unemployment, thousands of men on the waterfront battling to make an uncertain living were at the mercy of the ship owner. Methods of employment were degrading and inhuman. Lined up like so many cattle, worker was played against worker, unionist against non-unionist. And those who protested didn't get a job. You, you, you'll do. And you can fight like dogs for what's left. To keep themselves and their families from slow starvation on dull rations, men were forced to break conditions. Heavy and primitive gear, excessive hours of work often as long as 24 hours straight. Work in all weather and conditions, no protective clothing, led to strain and injury many would bear for the rest of their lives. fatigue and dangerous gear 
caused all too many accidents. But the job went on. Men were easy to replace. The depressed days of the 30s dawned with increasing hardship, bringing unemployment never before experienced in this country. Every morning, more and more workers joined the waiting groups at the factory gates, hoping for the infrequent job. And more and more were thrown upon their own resources to earn a few shillings as best they may. Evicted and the destitute found shelter under rusting iron, hessian and case timber. Women folk struggled to keep their families together, preparing meager meals in kerosene tins. of dole queues in a land of plenty. the waterfront day and night, living on the infrequent job and the dole ration. Huddled over fires, they waited through the night. And as though kindled by the sparks of their fires, the old spirit was emerging, the spirit of protest. To have the courage of one's convictions often meant the difference between eating and not eating. Profits went on.
the big overseas shipping lines still counted their profits in millions. Luxury belongs to those who never lumped a bag of wheat, sweated in a sugar boat, or stowed a bale of wool. In the world, you will find human crabs that eat their kind. Glutted crabs that devour all that falls within their power, crawling in gangs around these capes, poisonous, bloated, crab-like shapes. And these horrid creatures, wet with a thick, unwholesome sweat, have most hideous banquets here on a poor, drowned mariner Waterside workers, with thousands of other jobless men, protested against the injustice of great wealth on one hand and poverty on the other in the bitter unemployed demonstrations of the 30s. On the wharves, the times gave rise to a growing awareness men pulled in their belts and began to ask the reason why. For the many who suffered in silence, there emerged a band of workers who would not remain quiet, who refused to accept injustice. Through this misery was rising a new force, the men who would carry on the great militant labour tradition of Australia and give it direction and impetus never known before. But to do it, they had to fight not only the ship owners, but the ship owners' friends in Parliament. They found fighting leaders to match their fighting temper. They forced improvements, but only at the cost of many a bitter and bloody struggle. Today, the 24-hour shift is an evil memory. Victimization of the bull days no longer affronts the dignity of maritime unionists. A roster system of employment gained by the union ensures an equal share in the work available for all members. From the ranks of the waterside workers came one of Australia's greatest trade union leaders, Jim Healy. Under Healy's leadership, it's the rank and file who make the decisions and make the union policy. Today, an important part of union policy 
is to encourage the creative and sporting activities of its members. Lunch hour concerts are popular. They'll live in ship and station. They'll live in bench and fold. And falling out from Melbourne to... Facilities are available for every member to learn painting and drawing, music and photography, and to take part in healthy sport. And what of the industry today? Antiquated wharves and obsolete gear, which delay cargoes and add to the cost of living, are still used by wealthy shipping companies in an age of mechanization and immense profits. Congestion is serious on wharves designed for the sailing ships of 80 years ago. Surely methods unchanged for 50 years must be replaced by efficient ones in keeping with the times. In the interest of the community, the immense profits of the ship owners must be investigated. Men broken and aged in the industry deserve to be pensioned and so-called amenities must be raised to a reasonable standard. Surely this is the decent and sensible approach. The waterfront workers know that this great and essential industry must be revised to serve the people of Australia, not the lords of the overseas shipping lines. Like all other working men who understand the spirit of Eureka, they know they must unite to guard the conditions they have won at such cost, must struggle for better ones, and must meet any attacks with courage and strength.